trying to uh, attain another objective is political. Uh, yes, sir. Quick question. Uh, if we're not all aware, most people are aware of your stance on Second Amendment. And uh, it seems like things in certain areas of the country are reaching a boiling point, specifically Connecticut. In Connecticut now, they're talking about uh, going door to door and cross referencing lists where people had purchased uh, what was to purchase at that time a legal firearm. And now they're talking about putting their officers and basically the community at large in harm's way to enforce what many view as a law that is unconstitutional. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on that and tell tell us all what you think about uh, a situation like that and how there's over what they believe is over a hundred thousand at a minimum individuals who are are basically refusing to comply with their regulation. Yeah, that's a slippery slope with the Second Amendment. You know, I don't know what's going on in Connecticut. I, I have no excuse me reason to doubt what you just described, mm -hmm. but I don't have a lot of facts and. So I'd be careful in commenting the things I don't have facts. Call it a hypothetical situation. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> really a, I will not comment on okay. hypotheticals, but it's a slippery slope. When you start talking about gun registry lists mm -hmm. and this thing called universal background, the, mm -hmm. the, the attempt by the anti-gun people is not to keep the hands out of, you know, they say, well, we want to keep the hands out of the felons and the mentally ill. That's not their objective. Mm -hmm. Their objective is to get a registry, which mm -hmm. later on, they can engage in that sort of abuse, and that's why I'm very against uh, a national database for gun registry and universal background check, because it doesn't accomplish what they claim to want to do anymore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, It essentially yeah, makes yeah, law-abiding citizens felt. This is great. I don't want to yeah. get into it. Sometimes people say, hey, would you be involved? No, of course not. All right. Uh, but Part of that slippery slope is, see, I don't trust courts. Mm -hmm. All right, I trust this. Mm -hmm. I trust the rule of law. I trust the Constitution. Courts can get it wrong. And they have the United States Supreme Court and the Dred Scott decision upheld the constitutionality of slavery. Mm -hmm. The U.S. Supreme Court. In Plessy versus Ferguson, the United States Constitution upheld the constitutionality of separate but equal laws. So I don't just, well, well, you know, the courts, and we'll go to court, and okay. don't trust the courts. Trust them. All right, and that's why I think that the grassroots organizations, like yourselves, like some of the other ones, I don't care which one you belong to, NRA, Gun Owners of America, and I know there's some competing ones, and that's fine. Pick one that you like, get involved with it, because... These are organized efforts to fight this crap back. Mm -hmm. But you can't do it as an individual. All right? You have to be very organized. And you have to be, uh, you have to have the money behind it to get to Capitol Hill to, you know, when you go to the United States Supreme Court and you fight some two-year battle on a gun law, it costs a lot of money. Yeah. That's why I said the individual can't do it. You'll never get a case before the Supreme Court unless you have access to some organization that's well funded and has the lawyers who understand constitutionality, you know, and how to proceed on these issues and make the case for it. Well, that, someone's got to pay for that. All right, that's how you do that is, is fight these things. And I tell people, fight it with the ferociousness of a junkyard dog. Do not let these people wear this stuff away. The Second Amendment makes the rest of this stuff possible. All 25 amendments and then the you know, five or six articles, seven articles. Second Amendment makes it possible. Without the second, they can take the first away, they can come and break it like this gun thing, and because what are you going to do? That's right. All right I, I think it's that safe. I really do. Maybe one or two more terms. Okay. Uh, Ma'am in the white vest there.
pushing us on agencies. Agencies are requesting it. So the chiefs, uh, the sheriffs, there is a process for buying surplus army equipment. And uh, they have inventory lists of what they have and they put in. You say, yeah, I want that, I want this. And uh, Same with the cell uh, phone tower interceptor. They're not saying here, take these. These agencies are buying them and they're getting federal grants. And this stuff's expensive. I think these cell phone tower interceptor, they're like $250,000 a unit. Wow. Okay. <laughs> but there's grants. So the agency applies for the grant and they don't have to get it through the budget, which means they don't have to go through the budget process and a budget hearing. And that's how they're kind of getting around, which is why you're going to want to know. Because it's my money. It's my it's input to the federal government. Check. Right. Federal government's still your money. They never knew who it was. Right, it says we the people. It doesn't say we the politicians. It doesn't say we Capitol Hill. It says we the people. Yes, ma'am, in the uh, turquoise, I think it is. Is that what it is? Is that the color is? I guess I need to go to my Ralph Lauren. <laughs> color chart, get the latest. Book. It's turquoise to me, okay. Yeah, go ahead.
but I mean it can be a wonderful thing and, and some of the new stuff going out it, it can it can be a force for good but it can be a force for abuse mm -hmm. so there may be some situation where you have some high profile event and you want that the reason why like I said the Boston bombing occurred was not because they didn't have enough surveillance cameras and not because they didn't have enough police uh, station they, they double the amount for this year they're going to have 3,500 Boston police officers along the route. They said twice the amount. That's not why these guys pulled it off. There was an intelligence failure. Mm -hmm. You could have had 7,000 <laughs> cops, Boston officers there last year and still would have happened. All right? Because unless you got them lined up one by one, arm, arm to arm, to, to cover the whole room, uh, you know, and then lay on top of that the surveillance uh, capability. So I'm not saying that they don't need that stuff. That's not why these things are happening. So we want to prevent detect, disrupt terror. It isn't by putting more cops there, and it's not by putting more surveillance cameras. Surveillance cameras are, are of a great assist after the event. That's how they caught these guys, after the event. The intelligence disrupts it before it happens. So you need effective, actionable intelligence, and then you still, okay, so you still need, you know, police, and you need these cameras and all this, but if you don't have the intelligence, you don't have enough police officers that could have stopped that event. And the same with 9-11. Uh, it's the same thing. 9-11 is not about airport security. 9-11 was an intelligence fail. The CIA, the FBI, the NSA knew every one of those hijackers. Knew of them before that, long before that date. Some of them were on no-fly list and were flying freely in the United States. Those were intelligence fields. So what did we do? We went to Patriot Act. We, we created the Department of Homeland Security thinking, hey, we got to do something. We're gonna, and this is prove the intelligence process. Okay, so what do they do? Not airports. They punish you because our intelligence agencies fail us. You got to take your shoes off. You can't take liquids on the plane. You got to get strip searched. You got to be viewed naked going through the plane. <laughs> because our intelligence agencies let us down. All right, we're working on the wrong thing. I'm not saying we need no security at airports. We don't, look at, we don't need to look at people naked. All right, we don't need to do that. All right, and I've been to Israel and looked at their airport operations at uh, David Ben-Gurion International Airport. <coughs> take liquids onto the airplane and, and it's removed. Is at higher risk <laughs> on a daily basis than we are? Because that stuff's not effective. That stuff looks good. You know, and I say we got to do something meaningful. Now other countries like uh, my wife and I went to Mexico. We go to Mexico uh, every year. And they don't make you take your shoes off coming out of that airport. That doesn't mean they've loosened it. It just didn't make any sense. Profiling works for terror. Oh, that's a bad thing. <coughs> Ask uh, the Israeli uh, uh, Mossad. police and, and, and their security agencies, uh, they, they do it a lot different, and they're more effective. Are they perfect? No. You don't have to be perfect. You just got to be good. And they are. And the same with MI5. I mean, MI6. Yeah, MI5. MI6 in the UK. Are they perfect? No, they've had a couple of terrorist attacks. And uh, they admitted, yeah, these were fails. We blew this one. You never hear that on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. We did the best we could. Our people are good, and they worked hard. And they <coughs> I heard one being grilled on Mueller the other day. It was an old footage. And, and one of the people on the Hill asked, has anybody in the FBI been held accountable for one of these terror attacks, 